Welcome to our final Murphy Institute event for the year. My name is Tommy Bevacolel. I am a 2L here at St. Thomas. I am very excited to welcome you to our event this afternoon. The Murphy Institute is a collaboration between the law school and the Center for Catholic Studies. Our co-directors, Monsignor Father uh, Martin Schlag, and of course, Professor Gregory Sis would both like to welcome you to this event. Uh, Professor Sis is currently not here. He is uh, coming back from his appellate oral argument in San Francisco. So he is in transit on the way back with his work with the clinic. So of course, we are going to talk about St. Kateri Tekawitha, who this beautiful icon we have here. So I'll give just a brief sort of agenda of what's about to happen, and then I will introduce our first speaker. So we will have, of course, the artist, Mr. Nick Markell, will do a brief introduction of the icon, process, all of those things. Then we'll have two speakers this afternoon. We'll have Father Chris Collins, um, and we will also have Kelly Drummer. Um, so I will let uh, Mr. Markell go first, and then I will briefly introduce Father Collins and Ms. Drummer, and then we'll go from there. Well, it's uh, an honor to be here. My name is Nick Markell. Uh, I am a uh, iconographer. I have a sacred art studio uh, living in Stillwater. And um, it's, a, it's, again, a great honor to be here to be part of the celebration of this icon of St. Kateri. Um, I'll be around after the presentation a little bit to talk a little bit more with people who are interested in, in other details I, I can't get to in the, in the brief presentation I have here. Um, but I'd be happy to uh, talk to you more about that. I also have for those interested, I will shamelessly promote my workshops. Um, we do two or three around the uh, this, the area here every year uh, in which people can participate. And at the end of one week, they will complete an icon. So this little brochure goes into more detail about the various steps and process uh, in what we do. Um, <clears throat> one day, a little boy was in a church with his mother. As his mind wandered during the mass, he noticed all the people in the stained glass windows. He asked his mother who these people were. She said that they were the saints of God. The next day in catechism class, the teacher asked the students to raise their hands if they knew who the saints were. Excited to know the answer, the little boy raised his hand and was called upon. He said, the saints are those through whom the sun's light shines. Sometimes it's a little child who reminds us all of what it's all about. Unless we become like little children, we will not enter the kingdom. The saints are those through whom the light of the Son of God shines. What is true in glass is also true in pigment. We are all called to holiness. We know this from the Second Vatican Council. St. Kateri responded to that call with her entire life. She is for us a reminder of God's light, life, and love in this world. Today, we live in a world of icons. Those small images on our computers and our iPhones. What we know is that when we click on them, a much larger world opens up for us. The same is true with this icon of St. Kateri. But even more, not only ideas or a set of data, but a person is revealed. A much larger world opens up for us as well in our own lives, if we but allow it to be so. You might think that an icon is revealing in color, form, and line, what the scriptures reveal to us in letters, words, and sentences. It's a visual language of truth, faith, hope, love, and a new creation. In an icon, you will notice that the images look stylized. This is so because they reveal that those who live in Christ are transformed. <clears throat> They're transfigured. They are made anew in Christ. They no longer live. Christ lives in them. Thus, an icon reveals to us a life of complete harmony, unity, and a new beginning. You will also notice in most icons gold, 24 karat gold 
in this icon of Kateri. This is a symbol of the heavenly realms, divine life. Heaven is saturated with the splendor of Christ, who is for Kateri, her light, and that of all the saints. Her garments are faceted like a diamond. As she suffered for Christ, fasted, gave away everything for him, she became more by becoming less, like a diamond which must be cut. Being less, the light comes through it more brilliantly and beautifully. There is a lily, or St. Kachiri is known as the lily of the Mohawks, pure and fragrance of God. On her scroll are words that she spoke, which remind us today and every day of our destiny, if we but so choose this, to give all for Jesus, nothing matters more. Who then was St. Kateri? And who might we become because of her? Our speakers today, Father Collins and Kelly, will share with us their thoughts on this amazing saint of God. And in the days and weeks ahead, this icon of St. Kateri will be placed on the wall of your journey to the chapel. Like a spiritual counselor, she waits for us, poised, patient, and ready to hear us in our need. She desires God for us, supremely able to intercede for us and help us to be remembered of God in our lives, who is active alive and will never rest in his love for us. Spend time with her through this icon and give all the praise and the glory to God who is our destiny. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Markell. I will now just briefly introduce our next two speakers. Uh, we have Father Chris Collins who is the Vice President for Mission at the University of St. Thomas. His research and teaching are in the areas of systematic theology and spirituality. His latest book, The Habits of Freedom, will be coming out, I believe it's, is it this year? Oh, it's already out. I haven't bought it yet. I guess I'll be going and buying a copy pretty soon. And then, of course, we have Miss Kelly Drummer, um, who is the president of MIGZ, a Minneapolis organization providing a strong circle of support that nurtures the educational, social, economic, and cultural development of American Indian youth. Prior to joining the organization in November of 2018, Kelly served as the founding president and CEO of Tiwahe, I got that right, foundation uh, for seven years. Tiwahe is an American Indian community foundation which focuses on providing micro grants to American Indian communities, strengthening leadership initiatives, and network building. One final note, this event is being recorded and will be posted on the Murphy Institute website, so you'll get to see the icon again and also hear all of our lovely speakers again if you choose to do so. I will have Father Collins come up first. We'll figure this out. Good afternoon. Thanks very much for the invitation. And look Sorry, is that too close? <laughs> um, appreciate the invitation to be here. I'm going to reflect just very briefly on St. Kateri, but I'm especially privileged to be able to be joined by Kelly, and I'll say more about how we got to meet. But, and, it, and I'm glad you mentioned that, that, that beautiful meditation on the saints and being reflected from the sun. And I was thinking of that too. Uh, there was a great homily from Pope Benedict years ago on, on All Saints Day. That, that use that same kind of imagery the, to think about the saints in unique ways, reflecting the light of the sun, the son of God in this, in this sense, right? So that's what it makes a saint, you know, in different ways, we have our lives touched by God in the flesh in, in Christ, and the, but the unique circumstances that we're in, the unique challenges that we're in, the unique strengths and weaknesses that we've all got, all of those somehow or another for the glory of God can be reflected. And, and to think about, I think it's a, it's a great possibility to reflect a little bit on, on St. Kateri, to think about someone from the 17th century in a different culture and how different it is. And I think one of the temptations when we think about saints is 
from the, just think about, you know, we see beautiful statues and beautiful pictures and we can think, well, look how serene and holy that person was, probably came out of the womb like that, uh, right? And that's just not the case, right? Ultimately, that's where we all get to by way of our, our faith and, and sanctity, but we go through hard times and, and St. Kateri from the, born in 1656, uh, in upstate, what is now upstate New York, and then later was in in uh, all that being at that time called by some New France as the Dutch and the French colonists coming in into that part of the world. And you think about, and some of you may probably know more about more than I do about uh, Saint Kateri, but born into a, a time and a place and a cultural context of tremendous upheaval and and violence and confusion and woundedness and power struggles and so on. Even from within her own family, she herself, her mother was Algonquin. She herself was captured by Mohawks. Well, why Mohawks were raiding other tribes? Why? Because they were losing so many people in their own population, as I was reading about it, because of the disease that came, because of this conflict with the Europeans and so on. Uh, as they were losing population, that turned to more violence, uh, even between tribes, but of course, all the power and the violence that came because of the of the colonization that was going on. Uh, so she herself, uh, born into a family and very difficult circumstances, very painful circumstances, and even her own, no doubt, we don't know, we don't know a whole lot. A lot of this, this is all secondhand for the most part by those who got to know her, in particular, uh, Jesuit priests who wrote biographies of her within a few years of her dying. But you think about all of those different clashes of cultures and conflicts and violence and where and where am I? <laughs> and where is God in the midst of all that? And and I think that certainly can speak to perhaps our times now. And we think about all of the macro challenges and macro issues and Reasons for discouragement, frankly, it seems to me, in our in our world, in our more local context too, and and to me at least, there's all kinds of reasons to be discouraged by the state of our human condition and our human relationships and so on. And at the same time, we zero in. I think that's part of the gift of the the communion of saints for us to to reflect on and to kind of capture our imagination, to take seriously those places of the woundedness in the human family and the harm that gets done and the confusion about where we are and the grace of God can touch one person in a mysterious way that gives her the strength to, to know who she is, to know that ultimately she is beloved of God, even as she is rejected in different ways, even within her own family, not finding a place of belonging, Leaving her village, going to a place, a uh, village of, of native peoples that were served by Jesuit missionaries, but that had a whole other set of challenges and problems with the, with the French colonists and so on. So, but somehow or another, she's able to live this life of faith and grace, and so much so that in, in a very quiet way, I mean, she, as you said, she only lived into her mid 20s, died young, smallpox from the very beginning. As Monsignor Slide was saying during the mass, scarred by that that smallpox, and covered up a lot of her life in shame and hiddenness and separate and so on. And somehow along, even in that hiddenness of a young girl in the midst of all that kind of upheaval, she still is this light that shines in a place in such a way that. The Jesuit missionaries there who got to know her well were so moved by her sanctity and her courage, her strength, and so on. And almost immediately upon her death, also because of that miraculous experience that, that people saw after she died, and all of those scars, which is a powerful image itself, all the scars of her life uh, were moved and, and into that place of, of, of beauty and serenity or something. That in itself is, a, is an image to kind of reflect on. You know, the different wounds that we all carry in our own lives, that, that all of that can be informed. But to think uh, in this one icon of one person, the place of encouragement and the, and the judges wrote down her 
biography soon. And because of the times, by the way, in the 17th century, you know, one of the practices of Jesuits, then luckily we don't have to do that much anymore. But uh, <laughs> you'd have to write, especially if you were out on the missions like that, out in in uh, in what's now upstate New York or Canada, you'd have to write every at least once a year back to the general in Rome and give updates on everything that's going on. And those letters would get circulated all over the world, really. So within a matter of years, the story of that hidden <laughs> girl in the, the rural, the remote part of, of North America and her life of sanctity, that story was sent throughout China, throughout Latin America, there, and there's devotion to her like almost immediately globally, kind of, kind of amazing. There's something about her life and story that captured the imagination, not just locally, but really globally, and it's a sign of encouragement for, for the church throughout the world, really. And of course, maybe to jump up to the more, more recent times, as you might know, uh, and as St. Cateria is canonized, 2011, I think it is, that, that she is canonized. Um, but that was a long process for, na for Native peoples, especially Native Catholics in throughout North America. Great devotion to her the whole time, obviously, and to such a degree that there's also, as you might know, an annual conference, uh, the Tekwitha conference that happens and, and it gets moved around different parts of the country for Native Catholics in particular. It's July too. It's in it's in Bloomington. Yeah, it's being hosted here in July. <laughs> and so native peoples from all over North America really uh, travel around. Went out with the path around the Pine Ridge reservation. We also used to joke about uh when the when the take with the conference was coming up, some people would call it the take a week off conference. <laughs> <laughs> because everybody wanted to get in the vans or the buses and how we're gonna get there. And that was like the main that was a huge highlight and bonding time and encouraging time for uh and the Jesuits got to take a week off too so it did go along on those the last one I went to was in Rapid City which is when they opened the cause for uh Nicholas Black Elk too uh, who, who grew up in, in the place uh right where your family's from and where I used to serve too so but in in, in that in all kinds of different ways the way that one life can continue to to give encouragement and be a place of uh a story that even though coming out of great, as I say, great woundedness also gives uh, encouragement for great um, confidence for the future and so on. So we happened to meet, Kelly and I happened to meet uh, maybe a month or two ago through a mutual friend and introduction, and we had a great conversation. And and the work that she's doing, and you, and you can obviously say more about this, but kind of in that light of Kateri, this young, young girl several hundred years ago, and the kind of work that you're doing to help foster uh, drawing the gifts out of, of young Native uh, peoples and, and children and, and young adults here in the Twin Cities. That would be helpful to learn a little bit more about that. So with that, maybe I'll hand it over to you. Sure. Uh, uh, day. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Kelly Drummer. I'm Ronald Lakota from the Pine Ridge Reservation, but I grew up here in Minneapolis my entire life. Um, my family was a military family, so um, my grandpa was in World War II in the Korean War, and they actually settled in um, the Seattle area, but my grandma hated it, so they um, decided on Minnesota to, to be the place. And so, um, but they settled uh, settled in, and so um, born and raised here, but been active in the community, you know, pretty much all my, um, my starting as a young adult, um, really working with a lot of American Indian nonprofits here in uh, the Twin Cities. You know, there's over, 30, um, 32, I believe, American Indian designated nonprofits here in the Twin Cities area. Um, and I actually um, uh, was a founder of Tiwadi Foundation, which uh, is an American Indian community foundation here in Minneapolis that grew out of a fund um, that a few donors um, were contributing contributing to for about 10 years. And then we took it, uh, took it on our own and uh, built an endowment. Um, but I, I, that's one of my, um, I think my proudest moments of my life is really working on that for 10 years um, because it is unique across the country. Um, I still get calls weekly about um, the ability for us to really um, create this foundation. We raised a million dollars um, during every session starting 2008 until uh, 2018. And um, that those grants are permanent and those grants are directly to American people. It's not a scholarship fund. It's not like you have to um, 
uh, you know, um, I, you know, it, it's based on need. And so, for, as a matter of fact, I just wrote a letter of recommendation for uh, a relative of mine that wants to go back home to Pine Ridge for a uh, naming ceremony for both herself. She had already secretly named and her children. So things like that, that, um, you know, they're $2,500 grants, but they make a difference in their life changing and connecting. Uh, a lot of us have, you know, 70% of American Indians live in their kind of urban, urban Indian setting. And so uh, Minneapolis is large. Chicago has a huge, uh, one of the largest American Indian populations, you know, Los Angeles, um, Denver, and a lot of family that lives in Denver, I just, you know, probably Father Collins, but, you know, my family all over, really, there's only three family members that really stay in the Midwest because, like I said, my mom and my members were in the military. And my father, my uncles, my cousins, you know, so they all ended up everywhere. But I stayed here. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think just reflecting on uh, just, uh, you know, I went to Mass and um, uh, last week, um, one of the appointments from the Rosebud Reservation, uh, Immaculate Conception, where my son goes to school, asked us to um, talk about star knowledge. And so um, we talked about, um, this, you know, the star, you have this light inside of you, you know. Um, and you know we we use a you know a different name for that, but it, it's the same light that we believe as Christians we have, right? So it, it's when you when when you look at how um, you know we live our lives, it's like you know we should live by the light. And so I think um, for me that's kind of how I, I lived. It's not like I grew up in the in the best circumstances. Um, you know, I ran away. I was uh, missing for six months. My parents had no idea where I was. I was a high school dropout. And I have, I have quite this a story that wasn't the typical path of someone that would be in a position. And I do really um, believe it's the light that was called, you know, for me to to, to do something for my people. I mean, in, in, in Lakota culture, we believe, you know, the, the strength of your community is the strength of your leader. It's all community-based. Um, so, um, like for TY Foundation, I so I got applied for the job. Elder said, "You think you're ready to like take this on and do this?" And I'm like, "I don't even know what I'm doing. I have no idea what I'm doing." And so, uh, really? you know, ten years later, uh, we established a, a community foundation. We had six million dollars, and those grants are forever. And that's what I wanted to leave for the community because I saw the power of and the life changing forces of just believe one person believing in someone else. And saying, I trust you with this $2,500. You're going to go to school, you're going to, you need, you need food, you need clothing, you're going to go back home to your reservation, you're going to, um, you know, attend ceremony. Um, you want some cameras to start your own business, take, start taking photographs. It's, 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 it's not like it's attached to, um, I mean, yes, you want, it, it's attached to a dream, a dream, much less than a check, a degree or a, it was, so it's really um, looking at our um, American value systems and that we value, we value your vision and your dream because that's what actually makes things happen. So like TY was a, a vision and a dream. Um, there was about eight of us and it, and it happened. And so the one night presenting to these children uh, last week, there were, there were fifth through eighth graders um, and the power of that story and just there, you could tell there was about you know about ten or fifteen of them that really resonated. They were coming towards us and asking questions, and um, and then my son goes to the school there, and, and, and I said, so is it embarrassing to have your mom, your mom there? Because no, everyone said you were nice. Like, <laughs> 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 sometimes. <laughs> so I said, well, not that I'm nice because they heard my voice as I'm talking. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little. Uh, background on that because that's um, still a big part of, um, I serve on the Wigley Foundation at TY Foundation. It's a big part of my life. I, I really want to figure out a way. Um, it's adult focused because uh, IRS and applications with money and kids. And, but I would really love to start something like that for young people because they need it just as much as adults. Um, so that's my other like wish through uh, my work at McGizzy. So I've been at McGizzy for uh, five years, so that's my foundation. And, um, you know, our work is with you. And um, if we can touch, you know, we, we touch about 300 or so youth a year. And I would say 
you know, that significant kind of mentorship one-on-one -on -one is probably about 75 or so of the kids we touch. And, and, and it is life-changing. I can see, um, I'll give an example. Um, there's these two young boys, they were freshmen, four years ago, now they're seniors. Mm -hmm. And they come every day at lunch and grab whatever out of the fridge. And they have been participating in our programs. And um, uh, Chase, who was like failing school and not doing well, um, just at the beginning of this year, was not on track to graduate. He got like all A's and B's recently because we've been really one on one, um, you know, mentoring. Mm -hmm. But our program, um, our programs are uh, one of them is called Culture, Leadership, Academics, and Wellbeing. We work in seven school districts so Minneapolis and St. Paul, Ridley, Farmington. Wiper Lake, West Ponca, and Wayzata. Um, and so um, in uh, the Minneapolis and St. Paul schools, we're directly in the classroom. So it would be a classroom like this, and we're just there. We're just support relationships and your relationship with students, really helping them set goals on um, that might be just like, I need to attend class, I need to pass this class, I need to do these three assignments. Um, I want to go to, you know, um, we just, uh, we also run a sugar bush, maple syrup making. So I have like, I should have brought this. Uh, I had like jars of syrup in my office to give away. Um, um, but anyways, um, you know, I want to go to Sugar, which I've never been. You know, things and things that are both a cultural um, kind of goal and then academic and um, well-being goal. So um, we work. We have two staff at All Nations program. It's a specific American Indian program that's self high in Minneapolis and then Harding's uh, American Indian program. We have some other classroom there. And then, um, you know, that work is really supporting academics. And then in the other districts, it's all cultural work. So we just brought almost all, all the students in all those districts to Sugarbush. In February, we took them to uh, Shantraka or Asema um, gathering and processing. So all these cultural activities uh, were constantly doing. And then we're actually in the school in the presence. So that's really important. And then we have after school programming. Um, I think this week they're going on a field trip, they college visits. Like I think they're they've done quite a few here. Um, like last during spring break, they went to Minneapolis Community College. Um, St. Cloud has a pretty a really relatively new program for American Indian um, students that want to get into education. We need teachers. Um, but you know all of those um, type of activities, and then uh, we're really looking at leadership development work too. So um, that's kind of all tied together. Um, but um, this summer we're 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 running a water sovereignty camp. Uh, uh, Joaquin and Thorne and uh, Hamaya LaPointe and I um, decided we want to do it, <laughs> so we did it, and then we learned a lot from it, like what we need to do. So we just kind of like sent kids out to the garden lines for seven days and it was like uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was it was wow they were like <laughs> so we shortened it to five days but then we're having all this wilderness inquiry and other uh friends of the boundary waters are like um working with staff before because I said like the only person that was my son would have been and, and uh one other boy otherwise the staff didn't really know it was we're lucky that we came out of it. <laughs> um but anyways, um, so that's running again, uh, and that's our claw program. And um, you know, it's all around culture, um, you know, indigenous indigenous rights, um, you know, um, uh, academic support. It's just you know, just how how do you you know how does an eighth ninth grader, you know, live in this world? I mean, it's it's you know, we have all of these challenges just in general, and then you have um, you know, family matters and other things that. Sometimes even creating the more barrier. So, um, tell us about Little <clears throat> Whipstock. Oh, well, she's the reason why I'm here. She's the reason why I'm working. Uh, she mentored me from the time I was in my mid twenties, and uh, mm -hmm. she was actually um, kind of like my advisor through the whole uh, TY on my TY foundation days. Um, yeah, I was we were, we were family. I mean, when she came to my wedding, and I moved we to we shared our um, lives together. Participation in founding mid seats. Yes, she founded a lot of organizations. I mean, uh, you know, not she didn't. She wasn't like public facing, but I would say TY Foundation. Even though I was like considered the founder of founding, she was instrumental in the success of TY. Um, Native American Community Development School. She was the founder of that. The Dope Day Charter School, the founder of that. Uh, Red School House, part of their. Um, you know, um, 
and you know, so many organizations that she really didn't get, uh, you know, did, you know, she just was a very behind the scenes person and more um, of a mentor to young leaders. I mean, I, <clears throat> you know, both, um, so Laura was the first president and then Elaine Salinas, both of them mentored me um, from the time I was in my late twenties uh, until uh, well, well, the latest still a mentor, and Laura's passing a couple of years ago uh, was was very challenging for me personally. And um, I think um, one of the things we're really working on is um, uh, Maisie started as a um, radio show, first person's productions that was uh, created by some students at the University of Minnesota, and uh, we have the digital archives. Um, so the show started in 1976, and uh, we received a grant from the Minnesota Humanity Center. We have digitized all of those tapes. They're, they're real, they're real, really old, old style. And um, so um, actually, Melissa Olson, who was a, a really good friend of mine, who kind of helped me out in our crisis after uh, the loss of our building, and she um, all of those have been digitized and now we're contracted again. And the University of Minnesota has a uh, intern, a fellow, American fellow, uh, not just create this partnership, but they're gonna be tra transcribing all of those tapes. And then we'll be in uh, the library, Augsburg, we kind of agree with Augsburg that they'll um, have the library cat catalog things so for people that have access. So it'll be a public access thing. So that's kind of the legacy that I um, feel really strongly of leaving for Laura, Laura's legacy with that body of work. Is that a lot of the narratives of oh, elder it's, stories? Oh, or I mean, you know, lots of stuff in the American Indian movement. And all the big issues that were happening across the Indian country, they covered it. It was like the only American Indian news goodbye that was actually, um, you know, researched and produced by American Indian journalists. So, yeah, so, um, and Teddy Gray Owl is her daughter. And that's who just dropped off all the syrup because uh, Teddy and Jim run the, run the sugar bush camp. Uh, we pay, I raised money to pay for the sugar bush. And we send out, I think there was about 500 or so uh, youth that went out this year and learned about maple syrup making. Um, so I, I want to talk about the other programs. So then we have, so that's the co op program, and everything's all inter intertwined, but. Uh, another body of work we've been doing for a long time, which is in relation to the first per the radio show, is we have two Indigenous Pathways uh, training and youth employment uh, programs. One of them is First Persons Productions, and the other one is our Green Tech um, Institute. Green Tech is relatively new, about six or seven years old, um, but First Persons Productions has been around since 1977. Um, but those two, the First Persons Productions program trains young people in film. Um, Film photography, um, social media marketing, podcasting, and radio. Those are kind of our five focus areas. Um, and um, I would I want to say like in 2010 when I was first at UI, we were really we were really focused at film because film was kind of an up and coming thing. But now it's like podcasting and radio. It's kind of weird. How, if you go back to you know 1977, radio was it. Well, now radio podcasts are, are kind of back. It's the way to get the message out. Um, and so um, those programs, basically, students are with us. Uh, we have four cohorts a year, and they're eight weeks long, and they um, come after school, and they're earning um, up to $500 to $1,000 based on their attendance. And um, so this last cohort that just ended, I'll just give you an example. So they're with us eight weeks, and um, they're producing, and you can, you'll can you be able to hear it. It will be across all Amber's radio stations, which includes KFAI and Sweaters, um, uh, Native Veterans. Uh, stories. So our youth uh, interviewed eight veterans because we have the highest um, serving military of any population, and um, and it's um, so the youth were basically they're creating the interviews, they're creating the themes, they're interviewing veterans, they're um, editing uh, the clips, and there'll be fifteen minute segments that will be aired in June. So um, and if you follow us on social media, you'll be able to see all this. Stuff. And then last summer, the city of Minneapolis um, uh, contracted with us to talk about COVID and well-being with, with um, students. And so they produced a whole uh, podcast series. If you're following our social media, you can look at all of this called You're Supposed to Be Okay. 
And now the city just contracted with us this spring to do a follow up of like, how are things now? Because last summer it was still, you know, really hard. And how are things now? Have they changed? Have they? So that'll be, but those are examples of projects. And then our Green Tech Institute really focuses on kids in STEM, um, all the STEM um, uh, fields, but then also really focusing on environment and uh, green, te green technology and careers in green tech. So our last cohort just finished up around energy and energy auditing. So they actually uh, created a TP and looked at how energy um, works now and how it works in the past and the concepts of all of that. Um, this cohort, they're actually partnering with Minnesota Academy of Science, and they're talking about transportation and pollution, um, access to trans, um, you know, um, you know, better transportation. And so they're um, actually going to be building bikes. They can take to have a bike, so getting more saving kids biking around the city too. So, um, and then this summer we're partnering with Indian Land Tenure. They're going to be uh, working on GIS mapping and land. Um, and then talk about land and sovereignty. And then we have the water sovereignty for where they're going, going in all these places. And then first person's productions will be working on it's it's a miracle because I've been there, I've been there. How come we don't have to tell our story in first? So they're gonna be highlighting all of our work and producing little snippets and videos of students that we can use on our social media. So that they but that's kind of you know it. Um, but I, I do want to say that um you know, just getting back to like a calling, like I did not want this job. I, I, I left too by one I'm like, I don't want to work in any community more community. I'm done with it. It's it's a lot because you're you basically have no life. You're in the community and you like want to go to like a Powell, it's like you're working, you're not it's there's no separation. And so um and Laura and Elaine were like, I have to take this job. Like, yeah. <laughs> so I helped them build <clears throat> I Elaine, I was leading to I Foundation. Elaine and Laura are both on the endowment committee and very active in helping me fundraise for TI. And um, they said, well, you should help us raise money for this building. And I said, okay, well, then figure your life out. I said, figure your life out. I was like, okay. So um, I did that. And um, so between March and November, we had raised or one point two million dollars to build a new building. And so we built the new building. And it was finished in August of 2019. And unfortunately, we lost the building and operating in uh, three years ago, almost. Three years. So, in that process, we've um, now um, we bought another building, uh, Little Brothers of the Elderly, right on Lake Street. Um, it, I just had a meeting today with all the contractors that'll be done on the end of June. We'll be moving in. So, and it's a bigger and better building, but it sure costs a lot. I'm not sure. <laughs> Sure, a bigger project than what I wanted to get into. But so, like, literally, in five years, we've been through so much uh, heartache and crisis and everything. And I just feel like the staff that we have, the people that we've been with, the kids, like, um, I feel like a lot of organizations are like overclosed or whatever. But I'll, I'll say, like, two weeks after our fire, we found a place we told kids we were going to employ kids that summer of 2020. Nobody else was, nobody else wanted to be open. Nobody else wanted to leave. Um, but the Indian OIC opened up their doors and they were doing program, but I said, well, we're going to do it. And they're like, you're crazy. I said, no, nope, we're going to do it because we can't, we can't show that we're not going to be there. And I made it, I mean, it really made a difference. And so um, um, we ran uh, programming. Um, we worked with about 10 young Indian girls that summer in our five program. And then I think it was about, because we were the only ones that would take kids, I think about 18 and 20 kids we employed that summer. Which I keep spacing, I remember just like everything was mm. like it was spacing. <laughs> so um we'll be in a new uh new building, T Tech Center, Best Buy is um we'll have a recording studio, so we'll be able to, we won't have to farm out our radio programming, um green green tech center, maker space, um will be solar in the building. City Minneapolis is going to have a pollution control monitor. We're right on Lake Street and Cedar almost. Um, yeah, the huge community space, the fireplace that is like, you know, it's going to be a really cool. We had to put gas in there with us, we would. But yeah, so rooftop overlooking the cemetery, the only green space on Lake Street, Bay Green. There's three here in there now. There was one, there was two, now there's three. 
you know, some little um somewhere having all those ones and not very fast to do it. So yeah. Thank you. One quick question, maybe uh, some other questions too, perhaps, but um we do that. We can take yeah. one or two. Yeah. Oh, uh, so being at the law school here and future some future lawyers, some current ones, and whatnot, what any seeds to plant with respect to your work and needs on the horizon or what needs to be attended to or well it was interesting because I had a meeting with staff right before okay and, and one of the things that um David was working with the uh, like free tech was around um land back and land rates and really um if any if you know of any lawyers or anybody's interested in, in working with kids on treaty rights um or you know um any um purchasing of, of tribal lands that you know tribal hands things like that. That was one of the requests that they had of me today is we really want to start working with kids because um, they we had focus groups and they said they want to learn more and yeah. how do we want that. Yeah, it was some of the coursework here too, I think, with Green Lobo and then Casey Matheson is a recent, fairly recent grad, is that right? I met her a few years ago and she's with the, uh, the you know, like the affinity mm -hmm. of the Bar Association for Permanent and Indian people and she's a Fairly recent, right? That's true. Yeah. I think that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So we're looking for. Yeah. Chances kids, for yeah. younger kids to learn yeah. about those things. Yeah. Well, I guess we yeah. thank our two speakers here for. <laughs> they had two three brief comments, I suppose. So thank you again to all who have partaken in all of our events today, the mass, um, this event, of course. Um, this is our last Murphy event for the new year. Um, we will have events starting in the fall, so just kind of keep an eye out on your emails and things to be on the lookout for those upcoming events. I do want to highlight the Tegelita conference. Of course, there are flyers on the ends of the room, so if you do want to grab one and take one on your way out, please feel free to do so. And I think I'll call it that. Thank you all for being here. And of course, uh, these folks are here around if you do want to ask them questions, discuss with them more. And of course, please take some time to observe the icon as well. Thank you all for being here.